I have been at the uh, Tool of the Unknown Soldier two times. And both times it was very emotional for me. Uh, not that I thought Bill was there, you understand. But he could be. He, he's, he's missing. I have wished many times that uh, Al could be the unknown soldier. I'm, I'm sure many uh, widows um, share that with me, but I'm certainly one. That would be a better feeling. So I am going to be almost 100% convinced in my mind that that is Dad in the tomb. But I, again, I will not give up my search. here at Arlington National Cemetery stands in silent tribute to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country. This is more than a national monument. It is the grave of men who lost their lives and identities fighting America's 20th century wars. Here we remember all the Americans who never returned from World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Here rests in honored glory, an American soldier known but to God. No one will ever know the names of the four unknown servicemen who are actually buried here. Their bodies were unidentifiable and could never be returned to the families who prayed for them to come home. For these families, there has been no body to claim, no burial to attend, and no gravesite to visit. During World War II, more than 400,000 Americans lost their lives. Over 78,000 of those who died are still missing in action, which means that nearly one out of every five killed was never identified. In this hour, you will come to know six men who have been missing for over 40 years. These are just six of the thousands of Americans who could be the unknown soldier of World War II. Frasers have farmed the lands of Ross and Ohio since the beginning of this century. Billy Fraser grew up here. He played football, basketball, was senior class president, and generally gave his two kid brothers a hard act to follow. Clark and Farrell Fraser often visit this memorial, but there is no body resting beneath the marker. They come just to remember their brother Billy. And after all these years, it's still hard to realize he was only 20 years old. He was a very mature 20 years old, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're he right. Quite a man for a kid. <laughs> well, he was. Uh, Bill was a very likable kid. He uh, was very popular with all the rest of the, uh, his friends and, of course, his classmates. He was a typical brother. We, uh, my big brother, you know. I was a, a little devil. Who was always into things, and he was my my model. And uh, he was always so popular, so I always looked up to Bill. And. Uh, he did a lot of things that included me and always felt good about that. There's times he ignored me, of course, but yet he was an awful good brother. My senior year in high school is when I first knew that I loved him, that I fell in love with him. It was one night we had a special uh, date and we were riding in the car and it was snowing. And that night it hit both of us that we were really in love. Well, I've never known another man like Bill. He was, he was special. At 19, Billy Fraser left college to enlist in the Army. 
He became part of the huge force being assembled for D-Day. Billy came home for his last leave in April of 1944 to say goodbye to his family before being shipped overseas. No one knew whether they were bidding a final farewell. And those were precious days. It was just home a week or so, but it was, it was good. And uh, I remember we took him to the train station in Lima. Uh, I could not handle it. Uh, I was so worried. He didn't make it. Billy's unit landed at Utah Beach on June 13th, 1944, D-Day plus seven. From there, they fought their way to Cherbourg and on through France. On August 25th, they joined in the liberation of Paris. The celebration was a brief but welcome respite from the 4th Division's fierce fighting. Well, Billy was, uh, he was a real good friend of mine, and um, he always reminded me of Tab Hunter. He was a good-looking, young, athletic boy. I think Billy thought he would make it home because uh, this was what you went on. This is what you lived on. The fact that you were going to get home to your families and loved ones. Always you had that feeling. But by the same token, you also had feelings that, hey, maybe it's my time, you know. Billy's letters home were infused with hope. The last one his family would ever receive was dated September 8, 1944. I've got sore feet, but they will get better. Hope all of you are well. I had a dream the other night that I was home and mom was making mince pie. I'm anxious to get home and down to business, maybe soon. Love, Billy. Maybe soon. September 19th, 1944, the first week of fighting in Germany. Billy Fraser had been overseas for three months and had already made the rank of sergeant. He was fighting on the front lines near a place called Schlausenbach when the enemy cut him off from the rest of his company. Billy bravely held his ground against the advancing German troops. He did not retreat and was last seen firing his rifle from his foxhole. Hours later, when American troops returned to the area, there was no sign of Billy Fraser. When someone gets word that your brother or son, whatever, was killed in action, then that's final. It's terminated. And you know it's death. And that's all. The prison's gone. But mission in action never ends. I think he was a shadow in my marriage. I think he has been throughout my life. Never will erase him from my mind. I wouldn't want to do that, but I never, he's been a very um, loving person to think about and remember. I mentioned then that I guess we weren't worthy of him. God, God wanted him for his own. Uh, that's what I said at the time. And, um, I've had some thoughts since about whether he'd be a prisoner and helpless to come home, maybe. But uh, I have more of a feeling that uh, God has him. I really feel <clears throat> that we talk about them. <clears throat> the heroes of war as being they fought for our freedom. And uh, I really feel that Billy paid the price. <laughs> that I can have a family. Well, to, to consider Bill and uh, being at the, uh, being the, in the grave of the unknown soldier would be, it's 
very presumptuous to think that, but I know it's possible. In fitting, yes. Uh, he would deserve that. The tradition of honoring our unknown soldiers began after World War I, when five nations, sharing in the grief of their lost sons, determined to pay tribute to these men who sacrificed their lives. Italy, Belgium, France, England, and the United States each reclaimed an unidentified patriot. On Armistice Day in 1921, President Warren G. Harding echoed the sentiments of the nation when he said, there must be, there shall be, the commanding voice of a conscious civilization against armed warfare. Veterans Day of 1961, on this day of remembrance, let us pray in the name of those who have fallen in this country's war, and most especially who have fallen in the First World War and in the Second World War, that there will be no veterans of any further war, not because all shall have perished, but because all shall have learned to live together in peace. Acting as the next of kin of the unknown soldier, every president places a wreath at the tomb of the unknowns. Holding this office brings with it many honors, but there's no greater honor for a president than one I've had on behalf of a grateful nation. I've laid a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. In performing this duty, I've acted as the representative of the American people but also as the representative of the family of that nameless hero resting in the tomb. For as surely as no one will ever know his identity, no one will ever know if he was their brother, son, friend, or father. So he's more than one serviceman who gave one life. He is all the men who gave their lives for their family's safety and their country's freedom. played football for the U.S. Marine Corps in the 1920s. One sports writer hailed the six-foot-four, 240-pound athlete as one of the greatest players this country has ever produced. Frank Getchy is remembered not only for his heroics on the gridiron, but also for an outstanding career in the Marine Corps, as an aide to President Hoover, and ultimately as an intelligence officer on an island called Guadalcanal. Colonel Getchy gave an order, no matter how quietly he might speak. He was an imposing man. His physical stature demanded your intention, and there was a note of authority in his voice, and people tended to be prompt in carrying it out. First, he looked uh, uh, awesome by his size, and second, he was uh, one of the neatest looking men you ever saw, a uh, handsome man, and uh, uh, y you couldn't doubt that he was able to do anything and as you, if you were an enlisted man, like I was, you'd have followed him anywhere. <laughs> Frank, although I say he's a tough Marine, I believe he was um, tough only in the military. When he came home, he was one of the kindest, most considerate uh, individuals you'd ever find. Almost like a woman, he was so tender. He was just a marvelous, nice man. Frank Getchy established his reputation as a leader during World War I. He had faithfully served the Marine Corps in outposts all over the world. After the war in the Pacific broke out, he was ordered to the Solomon Islands. By mid-1942, the Japanese momentum in the Pacific seemed nearly unstoppable. The Navy had turned back the enemy at Coral Sea and Midway, 
but Guadalcanal was our first invasion of Japanese-held territory. A few days after the American troops landed, a prisoner reported that there were many Japanese laborers who were sick, disheartened, and anxious to surrender. Colonel Getchi organized a patrol. Twenty-five Marines went out on the evening of August 12, 1942. Only three would return. In this particular situation, it was a, a feeling of reconnaissance and a, a mission of mercy that uh, we were going on. Actually, we had no feeling that it was a combat patrol at all. Just hours before setting out on the patrol, Frank Getchy sent a letter to his wife, Florence. He wrote, My darling, I think of you so much, and I hope all is well as it is with me. Lots of interesting things to tell you, my dear. All my love, Frank. Clearly, Colonel Getchy had no idea what was about to happen. patrol left by boat just as darkness fell. The Marines landed at the mouth of the Matanakau River and went ashore. After a few minutes, Colonel Getchy headed toward the jungle. And then he and First Sergeant Custer stepped inside of the woods, which were heavy growth of vines and what have you, to find a place for us to sleep that night. It was then that uh, a few shots rang out. And, and they were fired on right off the bat. Getsy was the first man that got killed, so they had to fight. The events of that night were so dramatic that a comic book action adventure about the Getsy Patrol was published later that year. It included an account of the grim combat that went on for hours. The Marines didn't stand a chance as they were heavily outnumbered and pinned down on the beach. So they fired at the Japs for most of the, uh, the night and uh, little by little they get picked off and picked off and meantime the people were being sent back to the headquarters trying to get uh, assistance. The comic book also recounted the moment when Joe Spaulding was ordered to attempt an escape to try and get word of the ambush back to Marine headquarters. While under heavy fire he dashed toward the edge of the beach, plunged into the water and began swimming for his life. It took Spalding several hours to swim the four miles back to the American beachhead. He was exhausted, scared, and badly cut by the coral. Even as he approached the Marine line, he still wasn't out of danger. I walked towards the Marines, and when I was within 50 or so yards of them, I noticed that one of them had, a, had a, what appeared to be a, a submachine gun, and it snapped up towards me pointed towards me, and at that point it appeared that perhaps, uh, ironically, my own men were going to kill me. The news about the Getchy patrol being ambushed wasn't uh, known to uh, us until the first man got back there, and uh, uh, as, as far as I know, it was this boy Spaulding, and I could see him sitting on the ground uh, right by the CP. Uh, he was ash actually broken up. Uh, he his, uh, had tears in his eyes and uh, telling about the, uh, his friends that were killed. The last man to escape the ambush saw the Japanese hacking away at the bodies of the Getchi patrol with their swords. A few days later, the Marines mounted a counterattack. We killed 60 to 65 of them, and I think we killed them all about three times each. Uh, that's the way you are when you're in, in combat. And also at the same time, I spotted this grave that had the, the bodies of the Marines uh, uh, in buried in sand and the arms sticking up above the sand, a, a huge arm. And it could only be Frank Getchy's, I thought. The awful image of that patrol uh, after I left, when I look back and I can, I can just almost picture what actually happened to those men. And you asked yourself over and over that same old question, why did God let you survive? A line from Sir Walter Scott could serve as Colonel Getchy's epitaph. One hour of life, crowded to the full with glorious action and filled with noble risks, is worth whole years of those mean observances of paltry decorum. Glorious action and noble risks punctuated Colonel Getchy's life and ultimately precipitated his death.
each time I change the guard, I go out and give 110%. Because get me, for me to give 110% is nothing compared to what the men who are lying out there in those graves gave. They gave their lives. And for me to give 110% is nothing. The visitors are respectful at times and other times they're not. Uh, sometimes we have what we call a bad day and everybody comes, it seems like they create problems. Most people don't come to pay their respects though, I should add, and they come just to see the men in blue uniforms. So they don't realize that it is a grave and it does represent thousands of Americans who've given their lives. Oh, our heart! The reason I became a tomb guard is, is because of personal reasons, because of patriotic reasons. Patriotic reasons is because I feel that to honor the men who died for me and who died for my family and thousands of other Americans who are living today is the greatest honor that I could have. Personal reasons is um, I have a personal indebtedness, you might say. Uh, my mother's brother was killed in Vietnam and uh, he had a lot to do in raising me. Every time I go out there and I face and salute the tomb, I read the inscription on the tomb and, and just think about what those men did for me. And yes, it is moving and every time that I go out there. In those days, particularly the girls in my group, we looked for the night on the steed. Really, we, we did, and guess what? Al did have a steed because he was in the cavalry at that time. And his name, I remember the name of his horse, he told me his horse's name was Booger. But as far as I was concerned, he was my knight on the steed. In the early 1940s, racism was pervasive in America. Even the United States armed forces were segregated. But Alfonso Davis, a black man from Omaha, Nebraska, had an indomitable spirit and ambition. In 1941, the Army Air Corps began what they called the Tuskegee Experiment, an intensive training program to see if black men were capable of becoming fighter pilots. Al Davis joined the historic program, which most people expected to fail. Well, there were many people uh, who did not want the Tuskegee experiment to become a success and that includes uh, many of the instructors, it includes the base commander. I realized that uh, throughout Alabama, uh, throughout the South, that things were very difficult uh, for black people. You could not go and uh, get a meal in a restaurant, you had to go in the side door or back door, or they had to take it out on the bag, and uh, those same things prevailed at Tuskegee. I knew Alfonso Davis as a member of the 302nd Fighter Squadron to which I was assigned. We considered him a dedicated, very methodical uh, person. Whatever he learned, he learned well. He was very painstaking. We called him a straight arrow. He was an A number one soldier, an A number one cadet, and A number one pilot. Al thought about the Air Corps really as a way to better himself and his condition. Also, he had a feeling he used to talk about being in the air. Later, he wrote letters about um, being in the air, what, what the universe meant to him, uh, how insignificant certain things in life were when you were looking from the sky down. Berdine and Al had been married for just a few months when they were separated by the war. The Tuskegee Airmen were sent to Italy, where they finally got the chance to prove themselves. The fighter pilot's primary assignment was to escort and protect the heavy bombers on long-range missions, penetrating deep into enemy territory. Well, we used to kid about the, what the German uh, pilots would think if they could see us in the cockpit. <laughs> that the United States was probably on its last legs if they had to use Negroes to fly up there. But the flying record of the Tuskegee Airmen is still unparalleled in the, in the annals of Air Corps and Air Force history.
No other outfit could claim that uh, they never lost an aircraft to enemy action during the entire course of a very intense war. Uh, yesterday I fulfilled one of my ambitions as a combat pilot. I got one airplane. On the last mission, in which I got a probable, I was quite pleased that the airplane didn't go down. Yesterday I was quite surprised and quite pleased to see it go down. Yes, indeed. That was a very good show. Uh, I was really surprised and thrilled to see that boy go down. That was something I was waiting for a long time. Well, I'm red hot now, and first chance I get back, I want to see another one do the same thing. The Tuskegee Airmen were justifiably proud of their combat record and the individual men who made them such a strong team. Men like Captain Alfonso Davis, who led raid after successful raid, won the Distinguished Flying Cross, and was twice promoted. News of his heroism was reported in the black papers back home. This particular um, article was about his uh, new position as the um, deputy CO of the 99th Squadron, and I felt a sense of doom. I was not pleased at all. I just felt that he was being put in a situation that would be, it was a precarious situation. I wasn't happy. I felt horrible. That's the first time I ever felt it. And it wasn't too long after that that the accident happened. On October 29, 1944, Captain Davis led two aircraft on a mission to escort a photo reconnaissance plane to Munich. On their way to the target area at 12.45 p.m. at an altitude of 19,000 feet, Alfonso Davis entered a cloud bank over the Bay of Trieste. He was never seen again. The morning the telegram came to tell me that Al was missing, I was asleep. The doorbell rang. I went to the door and the postman said, is there a serviceman's wife here? I said, no, there isn't. He said, well, I was looking for Mrs. Davis. I said, I'm Mrs. Davis. Oh, he said, I'm sorry. And he gave me the telegram. I didn't know I still had the telegram. I guess I just sort of buried it. But that is what I was dreaming. I was listening to him recite the melody of love to me. And that's when the doorbell woke me up. And that's what it said, missing in action. It was um, short, it was sweet, but um, Romeo and Juliet didn't have an anniversary. It would be the thing that I think would be befitting to someone who gave so much and got so little for what he gave, you see? They were so different. He was so different. Al was different. All the men like him were different, fighting for something that they did not have. And now that, you know, when hundreds and thousands of people pay homage to the unknown soldier, then I would say that's what he deserved. The tomb of the unknown soldier is our only national shrine, which is guarded by a constant military vigil, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I miss Pud uh, a whole lot. Uh, I probably, uh, over the years, have uh, uh, thought about him more than uh, any friend I ever had, probably. Sure, I miss him. Rolly Kinder grew up near the town of Williams in southern Indiana. His nickname was Pud, although no one really remembers why. They do remember him with great affection. Well, I'd say he was a happy-go-lucky guy, and uh, he liked sports, he liked music, and he just lived a full life. I never saw him when he was uh, really down in the dumps. He was always, you know, he always had a joke to tell you, and he was could always laugh about something, and uh, 
hunting kind of, sort of came natural for for Pud. He could take almost nothing and make a meal from it. I mean, we might catch a fish or dip it out of a mountain stream with our hands. He could build a fire with a couple of sticks and uh, uh, all kinds of stuff like that was just, he could do, was just natural. Kinder had no way of knowing how much he would come to rely on his survival skills. In 1941, on the eve of World War II, Sergeant Kinder was stationed at Clark Field, an American base on Luzon Island in the Philippines. The island was still beautiful then, and the soldiers enjoyed what would be their last months of carefree camaraderie. Well, talking about drinking Wally Kinder, uh, we didn't have any uh, access to uh, 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 beer or gin or anything to drink on, on the base. So uh, when we got kind of desperate, we'd go and scratch in the window of the NCO club and try to get Wally's attention and say, Hey, Wally, would you buy us a couple of cases of beer and slip them out here? Yeah, sure. Because they used to be able to sign a chip in those days and you'd pay at the end of the month. So Wally was always good for a case of beer or two or three or four packs of grandies to San Miguel A11A or, or Bamboo Gin. And I think that's one of the reasons we liked him so much. Most of those older sergeants, they wouldn't even talk with us. They'd get lost. Who the hell do you think you're talking? Well, go away. But Wally was, Wally was really a prince of a fellow. I don't know anyone that didn't like him. After their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese moved quickly to capture the Philippine Islands. What resulted was the largest surrender in American military history. On April 9, 1942, a starving and overrun U.S. Army was ordered to lay down its arms. As Sergeant Kinder and his men were on their way to surrender, three Japanese planes strafed the road and bombed them. Realizing that this would not be a humane or conventional surrender, Wally Kinder got permission from his commanding officer to lead his men into the hills of Bataan to become guerrilla fighters. We weren't ready to give up our arms yet because uh, we all had visions of, of uh, joining up with the guerrilla forces after we got out of Bataan. We knew that the guerrillas were organizing and uh, we all wanted to be a part of that if we could. So we decided to keep our arms and uh, take the chance. If the Japs found us, why, uh, at least, uh, you know, we'd have a chance to take a few of them with us. Because of Wally Kinder's quick decision not to surrender, the group of seven soldiers avoided what history has aptly called the Bataan Death March. As many as 10,000 Americans and Filipinos died on the torturous march to Japanese prison camps. Miraculously, Kinder's group went undetected by the Japanese, who were at times just several yards away. But on Friday, April 17th, at dusk, they had to cross a road that was heavily patrolled by an enemy convoy. This was the guerrillas' only route out of Bataan and away from the Japanese. Kinder, another soldier, and a Filipino boy made it across the road only to become separated from the others in a moment of terrifying confusion. Each one of the first three signaled that everything was okay and then the Filipino boy went across. And as soon as he got across, he went like that. And so Bill just took that as uh, something, something wrong over there. You know, let's, uh, let's hold it. After their separation, Millard Heilman never saw Wally Kinder again. Heilman survived for 14 months before he was taken prisoner by the Japanese. No one will ever know what happened to Sergeant Kinder over the subsequent 18 months until October 18, 1943. On that day, a small Filipino village bore witness to his brutal murder. They had held him prisoner two weeks. These Filipinos would feed him uh, whenever they could. Some Jap guards was... Uh, uh, more lenient than others, and uh, some of them would let him, let him feed him, and they held him prisoner two weeks, and one morning, real early, they came in there and got him, and took him out on this river bank and beheaded him. Excuse me. Still miss your brother? Yes. Yes, I sure do. Missy. 
Although there were eyewitnesses to Wally Kinder's execution, Army officials were never able to identify any of the bodies they recovered as his remains. Plans to bring one of World War II's unknown soldiers to Arlington Cemetery were originally authorized by Congress in 1946. The entombment was scheduled for 1951. But with the outbreak of war in Korea, President Truman ordered the ceremonies postponed. In 1958, one unknown soldier was finally brought home from the battlefields of World War II. The Army developed an intentionally complex selection process which guaranteed eternal anonymity. From American servicemen's graves throughout Europe and North Africa, 13 unknowns were disinterred, examined by morticians to make sure they could not be identified, and brought to Epinal Cemetery in France. From these 13 identical caskets, one was chosen as the Atlantic candidate unknown. He might have been a sailor or an airman, a soldier or a marine. He might have been a Nebraska farm boy or a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. No one would ever know. On the other side of the world, the Pacific candidate unknown was selected in Honolulu, Hawaii. Six unknown bodies were disinterred from American military cemeteries in the Philippines and Hawaii. The selection was made by the placement of a lay on one of the six caskets. The Pacific Unknown's next journey would be to the rendezvous point with the Atlantic Unknown on a ship off the coast of Virginia where the unknown soldier of World War II would be chosen. During World War II, the United States imprisoned 120,000 Japanese Americans in so-called relocation centers. There was a fear that these citizens' loyalties were to Japan rather than to America. At the same time, Japanese Americans were proving their patriotism beyond any question. These courageous men fought in the most highly decorated units in the history of the United States Army. One of these young men was Taro Tanai of Maui, Hawaii. Taro was actually a little bit, well, you say, what child is in? He's a bit naughty, and you can't dare him too many things because he'll challenge you to it, and a little bit outspoken, of course. Although Taro's family remembers him as a headstrong youngster who was never far from trouble, they respected his loyalty to both his Japanese ancestry and his American homeland. Taro was born in this country and I thought he was abs he has absolute uh, spirit of patriotism in him. In fact, in one of the conversations, he says, you know, his uncle, he says he's very glad that he's going to serve the country. And I thought that was a very nice spirit he had. Just months after Pearl Harbor, by order of General George C. Marshall, Army Chief of Staff, a Japanese-American Army unit was organized. It would be called the 100th Infantry. We had some fun, but it was uh, uh, really hard training. Some of the boys uh, even uh, wished that we could go overseas and uh, fight instead of training. Training was more hard. So when the, uh, the 100 was formed uh, in June of 1942, uh, I thought it was a, a good chance for us as a unit made up of all uh, Japanese Americans to do something and, and to prove something. You know. In the fall of 1943, the 100 shipped out to Italy. They immediately gained the respect of the men who fought with and against them. These, when they're rounded up, were plenty surprised. Suspicious of their own propaganda, Hans believes he's begun to fight Japan, too. Fritz thinks that maybe these GIs are Chinese troops, recently transferred to the Italian front. They've got a reason for being one of the top outfits in this war, as one of them testifies. 
I'm from Seattle. After war was declared, I was evacuated from the Pacific coast. When the call came for volunteers for a combat team, I volunteered from the relocation center to show my loyalty and to prove that I had the right to live as a good American citizen. We were so good because, like I said, we come from the same place. I know you, you know me, we all know each other. So we, we just uh, fight as a team. If, if you uh, sacrifice your life for your friend, it's an honorable death. And the Japanese soldiers from Japan has this. You know, they will die for their country, uh, no matter what happens. And it's honorable to die for their country. And uh, it's shameful to become a prisoner. And this kind of a thing, I think, was handed down to us. And consequently, our boys, I think, had a little more gumption to stick it out. Even in a heavy firefight, uh, the boys won't give up. You're always willing to close with the enemy. He has no bluff on you. And you've always defeated him. And let me tell you again, the 34th Division is proud of you. The 5th Army is proud of you. America is proud of you. In January of 1944, the 100th was ordered to take Casino, Italy. Their nearly impossible objective was to cross the mud flats of the Rapido River and take the German-held abbey high atop Monastery Hill. The Germans, from their vantage point, had a clear shot at anything that moved in the valley below them. The Americans tried to advance under cover of smoke screen, but the wind shifted and left them completely exposed. Man after man died on the banks of the Rapido River. At one point in the, in the casino battle, I wish I was with them, dead. It was, so, it, it was really bad, you know, I mean, uh, suffering and no food and, you know, just going, going. We had almost the, the, the whole platoon uh, uh, was wiped out. A bold and sometimes brash Taro Tanai had volunteered for the dangerous job of messenger. While carrying orders up to the front lines, he was constantly under enemy fire. We were stuck. We were just waiting for uh, time to withdraw. That's when Taro came. There's no, man to, there's no place for men to be walking around. When I saw him coming, I told him, get down, get down. There's no place to be walking. And he said, you know, he, uh, I, I don't want to use the word, but he was more, you know, uh, mad or disgusted. He just kept, kept walking to me with a message. Said, John, I have a message for you. And then, then the, the sniper got him, pushing gun, shot him. He fell right by me right on the side of me, and stayed there moaning for about three, four hours, then he died. Grave registration will not risk the, the chance of going up there in no man's land to pick up a dead body. You know? So my suspicion is Tyler was dead out there, and uh, we didn't have a chance to bring him back. And, and uh, when uh, the, the battle cleared, you know, in that particular area, the farmers came back, the Italian farmers came back, and and his body being out there for quite some time was, was decaying. And my sneaking hunch is that some farmer had buried him in a shallow grave and didn't mock it. There is no known grave for Taro tonight. His family can only pay their respects at a memorial marker for all the boys who never came home to Maui. On May 25, 1958, the Atlantic candidate unknown joined the Pacific candidate and the unknown soldier of the Korean War aboard the USS Boston. The Boston rendezvoused with her sister ship, the USS Canberra, off the Virginia Capes, a fitting venue where ships had been torpedoed during World War II. For the final selection ceremonies, the caskets were to be transferred to the Canberra via high-line rigging.
hospital in first class, William R. Charette, would make the final selection on behalf of the nation. Choosing between identical caskets, he would have no idea in which theater of war this man fought and died. It was very breezy, and you could hear the flags uh, cracking in the wind. And I can remember very vividly, as I walked towards the uh, caskets, the center one, of course, was already selected. He was from Korea, and the two outboard ones were uh, from World War II. As I walked towards him, I started to the left and thought, you know, I'll go to the right. And that's uh, where I put the flowers. And why? I don't know. As I laid the wreath, I was thinking, here lies a man, really, no one knew, and now he'll rest uh, in Arlington. I really wonder who he is. To make the final selection for the man that rests now in the tomb for the unknown was probably one of the greatest things I ever did in my life. And the reason being not just for myself, but the fact for my children and their children, because it's something that they'd be able to tell them, you know? Your grandfather, your great-grandfather uh, did such a thing. It's just, <laughs> it's history. In 1943, I was a radio operator in the Navy at sea in the South Pacific. I lost my ship and friends I loved and respected. Shipmates I'll never forget. In those days, the seas were full of brave men and gallant ships. The USS Chevalier was part of our fighting force in the South Pacific. One of this destroyer's 300 men was Chief Petty Officer John Burton, a 20-year Navy veteran from Georgia who ran one of the ship's engine rooms. On October 6, 1943, the Chevalier was in a heavily Japanese patrolled area of the Solomon Islands known as the Slot. Burden and the rest of the crew knew that on this night, the odds were against them. Our job was to seek and destroy the enemy, no matter what their size. Our job was to protect the land people on the beach, and we had to sacrifice ourselves, we'd have to do it. We were the, the bad guys in their eyes because we'd come up at night and just, you know, shoot up whatever we could find. So they were always out there looking for us. And they had plane cover so they could come out and spot us and, and drop flares and silhouette us and everything else for their forces. The captain reported that they had nine surface targets coming in, Japanese and probably one, one cruiser, nine destroyers. And his words were... The enemy's not running tonight. We're going to go in on attack. He says, the odds are so great, it looks bad. He said, we may not come out, but we'll take as many with, them, with us as we can. He says, do the best job you can. God bless you. We at attacked the, ja the Jap column of ships at quite close range. and. Uh, they fired their torpedoes and we fired ours and also gunfire. Three destroyers in his group attacked nine Japanese destroyers and they made a good account of themselves. And the Chevalier, my father's ship, was hit by a torpedo. And was getting ready to sink. They were just trying to assess the battle damage and my father was on deck, I understand. And as I got close to the ladder to go up, I heard a voice, a wheel weak voice say, help me, help me. I recognized the John Burden's voice, Chief Burden. I went to Burden, I picked up, and the radar was laying on top of him. When he said his legs, he couldn't feel his legs. I assumed he had his legs severe because the, that area of the deck was all covered with blood, and I was sliding in it, and I got my hands in it. I tried to lift the radar, but it weighs over a ton. No way I could do it. I tried to talk to him. There was no answer, so I assumed he died right there. John Burden's remains were never recovered or identified. Other shipmates' accounts of that night allowed the possibility that Burden might have survived the torpedo. The Department of the Navy simply listed him as missing in action. Chief John Burden spent most of his adult life at sea. He was married twice and had three children. His sons were only four and six when Burden disappeared. 
Although Kurt and John never really knew their father, they have both been compelled since childhood to discover as much as possible about his character and his final hours. I'll never be satisfied until we find a body or somebody that knows he didn't come up after he went down the third time, so to speak. I'll never be satisfied until something like that is. Somebody actually saw him drowned. Or that's a shark infested area too, which made it even more or less likely he is going to be found. But still we'll never know. I think uh, times during this whole search for my father that I came close to crying when I've read some of the more moving letters from his shipmates, the ones that really knew him and have told me some of their personal thoughts about Dad. In Kurt's tireless search, he has sought out and contacted 118 of his father's shipmates. Burton Gorslein remembers Kurt's first call. And so he said, I'm not a shipmate. I said, oh, okay. He said, I'm a son of a shipmate. I said, well, great, you know, and I was just talking along to beat the band. Then he said, I'm John Burden's son. Well, that just hit me like that, and I broke up, and I couldn't talk to him. I said, well, wait a minute, you know, and I just, uh, the probability of, the, of that happening is so remote, and it just, you know, any other son of any other sailors called me, that would have had no effect, you know, I'd have been glad to hear from him, and and that, but this was John Burden's son called me the first crack out of the box. And so uh, I tried to tell him everything I knew, you know, and he said, well, I want to hear it whether it's bad or good. And I told him I didn't know anything bad about his dad. It was all good. And he was just a, a good, quiet man. It makes me feel almost like a new person because now there's somebody there that I can look at a picture and I can feel that I'm not looking at a picture anymore. I'm looking at a person. I have an idea of his thoughts. I just, I feel like I finally found my father. When we visited the tomb today, uh, my brother and I both felt very, I don't know, emotional about this thing. And like I said, there's no one in the world can tell me he's not buried there. And we'd like to think he is. After the ceremonies on board the USS Canberra, the World War II and Korean unknowns returned to American soil for the first time since they went to war. They laid in state at the Capitol for two days. Memorial Day, 1958. An entire nation paused to bid a final farewell to the unknown.
watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.